Yeah, man. Mm, mm, mm. Yes. Look at my man. Are you seeing all this deliciousness? Yeah. Cupcakes. Where do cartoons come from? Well, when a mommy cartoon and a daddy cartoon love each other very much, they f and out pops a new cartoon. Or you can just like make a pilot, but then the cartoons don't get the bang. They were gonna do it CalArts style. How very inappropriate, thank you. But yeah, back to the pilot. Since networks and TV channels want to save as much money as possible, just look at all the strikes going on. No, I don't want to drop my pan. Why? Before a full order for a new series is put in, they usually start off with making one episode. A pilot that's meant to show off the show's plot, style, and characters. Unless you're a minority, then you just get 20 episodes, no questions asked. But of course, most networks wouldn't just be willing to throw millions of dollars at the first idea they see. The pilot helps them get a taste, make the necessary adjustments, and get it ready for our eager eyeballs. It saves the companies money and it gives the creators a chance to step back and see what does and doesn't work. And it's not like these things went to waste either. Back in the day, there were shows like Kablam and Shorty McShort Shorts that gave audiences a look at a bunch of pilots, even if they never got to be full shows and no one did it better than Cartoon Network. The What A Cartoon Show, which was later rebranded to the Cartoon Cartoon Show, gave us tons of classics. From Dexter's Lab to Kids Next Door, even letting the fans vote for the shows they wanted to see. It's because of this that we got some of my favorite shows around. Anything that gives us the gift of Megas XLR has proven its worth. And it's this worth that made Cartoon Network think, maybe it's time to revisit this idea. So in 2008, a new project meant to carry on the legacy of the What A Cartoon Show was born. The Cartoon Institute, headed by Craig McCracken and Rob Renzetti, and named by Lauren Faust. The Cartoon Institute it will be a collection of 13 episodes, with three pilots shown every episode. Emphasis on would be. Judging by the distinct lack of projects greenlit by this thing, it doesn't take a genius to figure out things didn't go quite to plan. Yeah, it turns out that juggling all the new series that were coming out, along with these new shorts, wasn't something that Cartoon Network wanted to deal with. So, after only 14 pilots were made, they pulled the plug on it. Ah, ah, jump! I'm bored with it now. And out of those 14 shorts, only three shows were made, and two of them came from the same pilot. Compare that to the over 10 shows that came from the What A Cartoon show, and it's safe to say that things could have gone way better. They never even aired on TV. Should we turn on the TV? Nah. They were just dumped onto the website before being removed shortly after. Luckily, they were ripped, so you can still watch them today. I swear, the only things cartoon fans hold on to more than trauma are in P4s. But just because this project as a whole didn't reach the heights it was aiming for, it doesn't mean that the pilots produced for it were any less unique or fun. So let's take a look at what could have been, and go over every single pilot that made it to production. Because who better to decide if a show was actually worth making than an opinionated nerd with no actual industry experience. I'm your host and multi-billion dollar franchise, D'Angelo Edwards, and today I'm taking my hat off to the Cartoon Institute. Change. 
Let's start off with one of the more well-known shorts. I hope you're ready for a blast from the past because we're looking at Three Dog Ban. This one comes straight from Paul Rudish, a man who I've talked about several times. He's basically one of the guys that kept things awesome at Cartoon Network in the 90s and early 2000s. Samurai Jack, Dexter's Lab, Powerpuff Girls? Dude had his fingers in all the coolest shows on the network. And now, those fingers got a chance to make something of his own. The short follows a trio of three dog musicians, Luby, Sly, and Stavros. We watch their misadventures as they struggle to make it to a very important gig at a nightclub. I think the best way to describe this pilot is that it's the closest thing we'll ever get to a show from the 90s made in the modern era. I mean, yeah, I'm using modern kinda loosely. This thing came out 14 years ago, but you get what I mean. Shows don't look like this anymore, even back then. And while to some this might make it seem outdated, to me, it is been so long since I've seen anything look like this that it was a breath of fresh air. Everything about this is so cool dude. I love the main characters and the fact that they're designed around their preferred style of music, even down to the way they move. Stavros is based on electronic music so he's very precise, very angular. Sly is based on funk and he moves with a lot of looseness and style. And Luby? Well I don't really know what he's based on. I don't know maybe it's rap or grunge or something with the way he looks. All I know is that he reminds me of Money from Thugaboo. <laughs> You're so cute, Money. You must really like me. Yo, don't play with my emotions. Come to the crib. Yo, can he say that? Oh, that dog of mine. The show has a great energy to it, especially by the time it gets to the music scene, which is a bop by the way. The way the nightclub is colored is very pleasing to the eye, and all the background characters look great too, even if some of them look straight out of Dexter. This show also makes me miss the days of when cartoons were still pretty horny. Alright, alright, that's what I'm talking about, ladies. I'm looking for some big fun. Well, Rusty, looks like we're gonna eat our way out of another jam. Overall, I gotta say, Paul Rudish put his foot in this one. The main characters are all likable and well-designed, the setup is fun, and I'm always down for another musical cartoon. Sadly, though, I think all of the reasons that I like it are the same reasons that this one didn't get picked up. I mean, let's face it, Cartoon Network just wasn't making shows like this anymore. We were about to enter the Adventure Time era, and this thing would have stuck out like a sore thumb. I mean, look at how it starts. Three Dog Ben and Get It Together? When's the last time a cartoon was in something? Besides the cancellation pile. <laughs> Oh, I made myself sad. This pilot was super strong, but I think it's a case of wrong place, wrong time. It's such a shame though. Maybe in another life, Cartoon Network and this show could have made some sweet music together. The next pilot is a weird one, but Luba Lube's fun part comes to us from the mind of Aaron Springer, who's probably best known for his work on Spongebob, even writing on their only good movie. Your booze mean nothing, I've seen what makes you cheer. He also created Billy Dilly's Super Duper Subterranean Summer. Jeez, man, just saying that tired me out, so I'm gonna move on. But Luba Lube's fun park follows two carnival employees as they deal with their super weird boss, Baluba Lube, who is secretly some kind of alien or demon or something. I don't know, they don't go into detail. The three of them work together to find a new act so they can make enough money to save the carnival. This thing has some really interesting ideas that it messes around with, and while I do think that there might be something there, for me personally, it's one of the weaker shorts. For one thing, even though I think the backgrounds in this thing are amazing, the character designs leave a little bit to be desired. They're fine, I guess, but outside of Baloo, Baloop, who I think gives off a pretty cool otherworldly vibe, none of them are all that memorable. The same thing goes for the characters' personalities. 
You have a positive one and a negative one. And while this is a tried and tested trope, the writing for these guys just comes off as generic. I really think it could have benefited from another lead, maybe a girl to help even out the cast or something. But as for the concept, I think it's actually pretty solid. Baloo Baloo takes the two workers on a journey through different dimensions, and it's almost like a kid-friendly version of Rick and Morty. I think the creativity shown in a lot of these locations do a lot to help keep things interesting. I would've just gotten bored if it only showed the day-to-day -day life at the carnival. But still, I didn't really laugh all that much, and whenever they're not doing cool dimension hopping stuff it's just kind of dull but i think with some retooling they might have had something there i can see the vision it's just not quite there yet not terrible just missing a bit of the fun that this fun park promised Okay, so I knew this one would be a slam dunk from the minute I heard the main character's voice. I swear dude, you make Dana Snyder a character in anything and I am there. Dude's voice was made for animation. Danger Planet was created by Derek Dryman, who's more of a name over on Nickelodeon than Cartoon Network, working on stuff like Hey Arnold and Cat Dog. He's even gonna be the director of the next Spongebob movie, and if this pilot is anything to go off of, maybe this one won't suck. Danger Planet tells the story of an arcade machine in a forklift, escaping to an alien planet after being discontinued and put up to be destroyed. They just want to go to Earth, but since they're already junk, no one is being sent to get them. That is, until it's discovered that the ship they were on also had a human baby on board. Now the two machines are determined to both get to Earth as well as protect the baby from danger on the planet. Uh, The pilot is actually really fun. It's another one of my favorites of the bunch. The main characters have great chemistry, with the arcade machine just happy to be alive and eager to show his stuff, bouncing off beautifully from the more low energy forklift. They're both idiots, but one is a confident idiot, and the other one is just kind of accepted his place in life. The backgrounds have this really cool dry brush painterly style that really helps to add to the dirty, creepy mood, and I love how messed up the main alien that's after the baby looks. Just a gross shape-shifting thing. More shapeshifters should be gross. They literally break down their bodies and put them back together as something else. They can't all look like Mystique when they do it. But danke, danke. I especially love the design of the Space Ranger. She just looks so cool with those chunky Mega Man style gloves and boots. I do wish she had got a bit more time to shine though, but I'm sure if this had gotten picked up, she would have been featured more heavily. All in all, this one is a keeper. I think this is the only short from the Cartoon Institute that you can still view on the official Cartoon Network YouTube channel. Though for some reason, they cranked up the brightness on it. I don't even know how you make a mistake like that. With both this this upload and the trademark filed for Danger Planet, this led to a lot of people thinking that this would actually get picked up. But seven years later and nothing has come of it yet. But I think this one has got some legs and the world can never have enough cartoons starring Dana Snyder. So here's hoping we get to go back to Danger Planet someday. It ain't got no wire, look! So anyway, please help me. I am going out like some punk! Coming up next, we have one from the man I have an unhealthy obsession with, Gindy Tartakovsky. Don't believe me? Just look at the opening shot. That's the Gindy Gams on display. Maruin tells the story of two kids getting stranded on an island, having to deal with all the various plants and animals trying to kill them, while being befriended by one of the friendlier creatures. On the surface, this is a cool concept. You don't see that many cartoons about being stranded on an island. The only ones that come to mind are like Mike Lou and Og. Maybe Coconut Friend? I don't know. Art style is great, backgrounds are great, and I think that you can get a lot out of the premise. But this thing has one fatal flaw. The protagonist has some of the most extreme background character energy I have ever seen in a cartoon. These are not the kind of characters you would want to follow for a full series. 
These are the side characters that you cut to for a quick gag every so often. They're not even like the side characters who you wish had their own show. And these guys are just so unlikable. Here you have this stuck up girl, but not like fun stuck up. And this annoying rapper kid. And I'm sorry, but ever since the visit, my tolerance for these kind of characters has evaporated. I just don't really want to be around them. There's a reason the ship cheered after they got swept overboard. Even the creature that befriends them is kinda boring. His main ability seems to tie in with his nose and I don't think you could get that much out of it. Look, I love Gindy, but the man is not perfect. I'm sorry, uh, my body's not used to saying those words. This is a really cool idea with all the usual Gindy flair and polish, but only on the animation side. On the character side, however, I think it needed a lot more work because as it stands now, between being stuck on an island with them or taking my chances with the ocean, I think I'd rather prove some stereotypes wrong. And where, pray tell, would you be going? To a place every man needs to go just to prove he's still a man. A whorehouse? No, silly goose. Now, if you're sick of watching stuff for BABIES, this next pilot is for you. Yep, turns out that some of these pilots were gonna be made for an older audience. And not just like older kids or teenagers, this one is straight up for adults. Joey to the World comes to us from the mind of Craig Kelman. I don't care about anything else he did because he worked on the second episode of season 5 of Samurai Jack, the best episode of the series and my favorite episode of TV ever. I would just give him a show based on that. But since this came out before that did, he wasn't so lucky. Joey tells the story of a middle-aged kangaroo still living in his mother's pouch, deciding to go off into the world to start a life. Sadly, he is not equipped to survive out there. He's equipped with other stuff though. Tell me you did not sniff any glue on the way over here. You know how crazy you get. Don't be ridiculous. Yeah, as you watch this, you'll quickly find out that this one is firmly stuck in the adult column. There are plenty of references to sex, drugs, and a bunch of other stuff that would make the modern cartoon fan faint. This thing would be way more at home on Adult Swim, and its inclusion makes me think that they would have used the Cartoon Institute to find shows for both halves of the network. I don't acknowledge Cartoonita, but jokes about sex workers can only get you so far, so how's the actual content of the pilot? To be honest, it's not not bad. The art style is pretty appealing to me. Like Three Dog Band, it's another one that feels like it belongs in the early 2000s, but a bit grungier and dirtier. The characters are fairly entertaining too, with Joey's mom being played by the late great Estelle Harris, who has some great delivery. Uh, so long. You're dead to me! Love you too! <laughs> Joey himself is even played by Mr. Lawrence, though after decades of hearing him as Plankton, hearing him talk in a softer voice is pretty jarring. It's not perfect though. Like, there's a consistent laugh track throughout the entire thing, and I think it will be better as a sometimes joke instead of always going off and getting annoying. Also, I don't know if this could have worked as a full series. I think something like this is better suited to smaller, bite-sized adventures. Stuff you would play in between other shows. I would make more shorts, but nothing past that. But who knows, maybe over time the show could find its footing. But as it is now, it's fun enough. Joey might not be ready for the world, but I'm glad you tried coming out anyway. How do you do? Or as the case may be, how do you do do? <laughs> This next one I don't really have much to say about. The Borneos is a pilot made by Chris Staples, who if you can't tell by the art style, previously worked on Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. It follows the life of a family of carnival people, with the son feeling out of place because he's not as weird and wild as the rest of the family. There's nothing really bad about the pilot, but at the same time, there's nothing really outstanding about it either. None of the gags really hit for me, and none of the characters really stood out for me either. The 
biggest thing the pilot has going for it is its art style, but the animation itself is a little clunky. I don't know. The only thing that really stood out to me was that the font they used for the end screen looks vaguely familiar. Like this font is from something, right? This is gonna bug me all day. Whatever. The Borneos isn't bad, just kind of okay. And since this was made to make a big impression to get a full series, being just okay might have been the nail in the coffin. Meal. Cereal. Combine. Alright, we're finally at one of the shows that actually got made. The Cartoon Institute was the first home of the regular show pilot, though you could make the argument that 2 in the AM PM and the naive man from Lolly Land also kinda count its pilots. They didn't put any weed in this candy. It was acid. <laughs> what? Acid? What the fuck is wrong with you? And judging from this pilot, it's no wonder that this one was picked up. JG Quintel and his team put their foot into this one. It perfectly lays out everything that regular show would go on to be about. The relationship between Mordecai and Rigby, the mundane slowly morphing into the fantastical as the episode went on, and their iconic offbeat sense of humor. You want some milk? Yeah. Hey! You instantly get that while Mordecai and Rigby are best friends, Mordecai is clearly the leader of the group. And characters like Pops are pretty much already how they would be in the show. Some characters do look kinda weird though. I don't know who this is, but it's not Mordecai. Maybe it's the face, maybe it's because the outlines are a bit thicker here. Either way, that is not my pathetic Birdman. This pilot was actually repurposed as an episode for the main series, with a couple of added scenes and tweaks made to it. It. There, they frame it as more of a flashback episode, and I remember watching it and just thinking, isn't this just a pilot? This was one of the few that Cartoon Network had actually uploaded back in the day, and I remember liking it a lot. Little did I know that I was watching the pilot of what would be one of my favorite shows of all time, and one of the most popular shows on Cartoon Network. It was cool seeing characters who were a bit older that actually talked like me, and I'm glad Cartoon Network decided to give it a chance. Just overall, a really solid pilot and the great prelude to what would become the voice of 20-somethings for years to come. Next on the list is the awesome chronicles of Manny and Khan. This is the only pilot to have two creators, Josh Lieberman and Joey Giardina. If buddy comedy cartoons are your thing, then this is the pilot for you. Manny and Khan focuses on a leprechaun named Khan and a platypus named Manny. We watch as they play a game of The Floor is Lava, which they slowly begin to take a little too seriously. Though I get it. The simplest games are the ones that I used to treat as life or death as a kid. If you tagged me it, in my kid mind, that was the equivalent of spitting in my mouth. I don't forget those kind of things, Devin. But yeah, this is one of your standard two friends do wacky stuff cartoon, which makes it all the more surprising that this didn't go anywhere. Only a few years later, these shows were everywhere, with stuff like Fanboy and Chum Chum, Breadwinners, Sanjay and Craig, and a bunch of other shows I didn't like. So how does this one compare? Well, it's fine. Nothing really stood out to me personally. I didn't hate it, but it was just kind of middle of the road for me. The art style is nice enough, and they do an interesting thing where the lines that would normally be hidden behind other body parts just go through. The voice actors have a good energy, and Khan is voiced by Keith Ferguson, better known as the voice of Blue from Fox. Fosters. Man, they really could have just called this whole project Everyone Worked on Fosters or the Spongebob movie. Not that that's a bad thing, but geez. Also, the humor is just kind of hit or miss for me. Lots of in-your-face lol random humor that you either love or hate, though it did get me sometimes. <laughs> Boys love spaghetti. I know! False! Overall, while it's not necessarily my thing, I could definitely see someone milking at least two or three seasons out of this thing. I think it would have been better suited for Nick. Use those Spongebob connections, Josh. But for now, the awesome chronicles end here. I will no 
thrown away the friend making! Alright, finally time for an action cartoon. I was getting sick of just talking about comedy, and with a name like Spleen Stab, it's gotta be nice and violent. Alright, so maybe it's not exactly what I had hoped for, but Spleen Stab is still pretty good. Spleen Stab was both created and voiced by Mike Bell, who's worked on stuff like Turbo, Kung Fu Panda 2, and Phineas and Ferb, and uh, also, also the SpongeBob movie. It tells the tale of a barbarian named Spleen Stab who wants to give up his violent ways and learn to be nice. It, uh, does not go that easily. <laughs> It's a fun little short where all the jokes come from the juxtaposition of having this hairy, burly killer trying to blend into a society of bright, cheerful elves. But the elves aren't stupid, and most of them are afraid of Spleen Stab, with the exception of Twinkle, who tries to get the others to accept Spleen Stab. I actually really like this one. They kept the jokes flowing, and Spleen Stab and Twinkle, voiced by the legend Jeff Bennett, work off each other really well. Owie! 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 No! Jeff also voiced Treewise, a talking tree that acts as the narrator, and it's really funny to me that he's just doing the same voice he did for the narrator in Day the Barbarian. Tired of the ways of battle, Spleenstab left the land of barbarians in search of the ways of friend making. Which I just realized is another show about a barbarian, and now I think it was on purpose. Besides being really funny, you also feel for Spleenstab. All he wants is to be accepted, and make Maybe to like crush a few skulls along the way, and if that isn't what just any red-blooded human wants out of life. I love how all the backgrounds look like they were ripped straight out of a kid's book, and the bold outlines the characters have really help it to pop. Though I wish the character design itself was a bit more stylized, I want to see those shapes push. But overall, I think Spleenstab has legs, and I can safely put this one in the I wish it had got made pile. I'm not sure how long it would have lasted though, with so much resting on the shoulders of what is basically one joke, that being barbarian and non-barbarian environment. But with the right writers, I'm sure it could have been fine. Maybe they could have leaned more into the action as it went on. Sadly for now, we'll never know what could have been, but I would not have minded calling Spleenstab a friend. Edward the Merman. What? Not what. But yes! This is another one I don't really have much to say about. Yes is a pilot created by Dave Smith who's worked on a bunch of stuff, but I know him from his work on the Powerpuff Girls, boarding episodes like See Me, Feel Me, Know Me, and fan favorite Collector. Yes follows a family and a magical mermaid as they go off on a quest to spread positivity and help dreams come true, all through the power of saying yes. While this is a noble effort, I just didn't vibe with this one. None of the characters really stood out to me, and the art style is a little hard on the eyes. I do like the stylization of the characters, with it looking like your typical McCracken-styled affair, but the colors really started to grate after a while, especially with the outlines being done in such light colors. I didn't really find any of the jokes that funny. Is that fucking blackface, dude? Which is nuts, because the main premise of the pilot is teaching a robot how to be emo. That should be a joke goldmine, but they didn't really capitalize on it, at least to me. That's all there really is to say about this one. It's probably my least favorite of the shorts. Not a bad effort, but yes gets a no from me, dog. Um, hello? Uh, can we ever, can we talk about this like civilized people? This next one really surprised me. I wasn't really expecting much from Medlin Meadows, but it turned out to be one of the standouts, brought to us by the late, great Chris Riccardi, who's worked on a ton of favorite shows, from Samurai Jack to Monkey Team. This one has got it all. An interesting setup, a great style, and plenty of potential for future episodes. It tells the story of Boculus, a space alien who tries to bring technology to a less advanced race, only to be immediately 
immediately captured and set up to be sacrificed. From this point, it's him against the natives as he tries to escape back to his ship. The first thing that struck me is how nice this short looks. Everything has great texture and shapes. I especially love how the characters are contrasted. Like, Boculus is drawn completely different from the natives, which makes sense considering they're from different planets. It's a really cool touch, and the backgrounds are gorgeous. They were handled by Joseph Holt, who's done work for Symbionic Titan, El Tigre, and even Mission Hill. And all that experience is definitely evident in this. It looks great. And holding the whole thing together is Paul Rugg, best known as the voice of Freakazoid, who plays Boculus in this. Paul Rugg is great in everything, and he brings a great manic energy to this. But what makes him especially good is that this time, he's playing the straight man having to deal with these crazy aliens. It's all super good stuff. I really think that this one could have worked well as a series. We could have seen more types of future tech, seen Boculus try to adapt to the planet, or even travel to different worlds every episode. But maybe that would have gotten too expensive in the long run, I don't know. This one just seems like a slam dunk to me, and I'm sad it didn't get made. And now with Chris Riccardi having sadly passed away, it's unlikely we'll ever see any more of it. But this is definitely one that I wish it went to series, but at least we got to see a small piece of what this galaxy could have been. It's going to save the world! Save the world? Huh? In a shocking turn of events, we actually got a second pilot from Derek Dryman. In addition to Danger Planet, he also got to make Stock Boys of the Apocalypse. Much like Joey to the World, this is another one that I think would work better as a more adult show. But unlike Joey to the World, this one wasn't written with the same edge. And I feel like that's the main thing that holds it back. Stock Boys tells the story of a stock boy who hates his job only to be sent to the future, where his job is basically the only building left standing. Now with the aid of his best friend, who's now super old, and the old company mascot that's been mutated into a pig monster. These three are the only thing that can save the world, or at least make sure they can still get their creature comforts. This one is the perfect example of a fun premise with a kind of average execution. But there is a lot of promise. Like, the premise is really fun. We've seen the apocalypse done a lot, but it's usually super serious, so seeing a bunch of slackers tackle it is interesting. And while the art style is a little rough, it stands out with his grungy style and has a lot of charm, though the rigs were a little rudimentary. The thing that loses me, though, is the characters. I wish we got a bit more time with the two stock boys together. Hanging out with your best friend as an old man could be really funny, but instead, they stick the main stock boy together with the pig. It's funny though because he used to mess with him back when he was just a normal pig, so this provides a nice opportunity for some payback. The pig is actually the standout, seeing as he's voiced by Jean DiMaggio. He gets some pretty good moments, but the main dude just didn't stand out for me, which is funny because he has a robot body now. That should make him cooler. Also, I wish it could have been more crass, just to match the rest of the tone. Overall, I think it's a cool premise with an interesting style, just maybe needs to go back in the oven a bit. It, but I guess we'll never know. There is no one, not know how, who does not know of the great and the mighty Lador. Who are you? <laughs> this next one is kind of cute. Lador comes to us from Mad Danner, who worked on stuff like Shaolin Showdown. But Lador is another one that I think is just fine. But I could definitely see this one going the series just because of how much you could get out of it. Lador follows the adventure of Lador, a multiversal traveler who goes from land to land. Through the use of the door in his tummy, he's aided by his young apprentice, Francois. My name is Frank! Who would rather goop around and listen to Lador? Together, they try to prove that they're the best in the business, all while dealing with their rival group. While the premise could lead to some fun episodes, this one felt like more a kid's show. 
The humor is a bit more on the juvenile side, and the colors make it look like it's more for the youngins. And while the idea of different universes sounds cool, none of the ones shown were particularly interesting. Just a couple of side gags instead of places to explore. So while I think kids would get a kick out of it, it wasn't really for me. But that's in no way a negative. These shows are made for kids, so it makes sense that it skews a little younger. Other than the tone, the art style also didn't do much for me. A little too garish with the backgrounds and the characters kinda came off as stiff. But I did like Frank and Laidor together, they were fun. I also enjoyed the Doraemon reference these guys got going on. It's a cute idea that I think kids would have liked, but not for me. Nothing to worry about? I'll just build you a new one! You can build me a new computer? Not just a computer, but a supercomputer! Wow, a supercomputer! <laughs> And now we get to the big one, Uncle Grandpa created by Peter Browngart. If you're not familiar with Uncle Grandpa, it focuses on a magical dude who is both everyone's grandpa and uncle. And ignoring what that implies, it's just an excuse to show him going from kid to kid and helping them out with their problems. In the pilot, he ends up helping a computer-obsessed teen before ending up fighting against a gang of rabid mutants who might look familiar to you. Yep, besides Uncle Grandpa, this is the pilot that also went on to create Secret Mountain Force Awesome, basing the main character on the monster shown here, but we're not here to talk about that. The sign says no disgustoids! Huh, this guy reads. Now I gotta say, as someone who was never exactly the biggest fan of Uncle Grandpa, I kinda dig this pilot, at least on some levels. I like the style they're going for here way more than the style of the show went with. The bolder outlines, the harsher colors, it gives the thing the vibes of like, Ed Roth. The characters also have a faint shadow behind them like they were done on sales, and I can always appreciate that. The humor and style still relies a lot on gross out stuff though, so if that's not your thing, I could see that being a turn off. A couple of lines here and there really got me though. Surprisingly enough, for a while, the only show that came from this was Secret Mountain Force Awesome. That is crazy to me that the side characters got a show before the dude the pilot actually focused on. And when it came out, despite when a few awards, it didn't do that well in ratings, but the awards at least told Cartoon Network that Peter was on to something, and they eventually greenlit Uncle Grandpa for his own show, and the rest is history. While I'm more of a fan of what could have been based on the pilot, Uncle Grandpa is kinda weirdly loved now, so maybe the changes were for the better, but for me, the pilot is where it's at. And that's all the pilots that the Cartoon Institute managed to get out. It's a shame that more didn't get produced because some of the ones that we know about sound pretty cool. Like Dynamite Jones, a show that would have been about a retired superhero getting back into the game. The concept art for this one looks really cool, and it seems like it would have had a little action in it. The Cartoon Institute also could have been the home for the pilot for Star vs. the Forces of Evil, but it was rejected. Even though we didn't get a ton of pilots, for once there really isn't much of a crazy reason why. The network simply didn't have the money. This was confirmed by Craig McCracken, who said that the recession that started back in 2008 hit them too, and suddenly making all these pilots on top of the new shows they were already working on seemed like too tall an order. Bad stuff just happens, I guess. But the work that managed to be complete, regardless of how I feel about them, are all pretty impressive. So many different aesthetics, voices, and styles on display. I really hope pilot compilation shows like this make a comeback. I mean, even Cartoon Network wants to try again, with them launching the Cartoon Cartoon Shorts program, which is gonna feature a ton of new pilots from some names you might recognize. That's all I'm gonna say though, because I feel like if I talk about it too loud, they'll cancel it. But hopefully, this program will carry on the wheel of the Cartoon Institute. Because no matter how many shows they cancel, we'll never run out of artists just waiting for a chance to share their stories.